Hello to everyone who's joining in on YouTube. Um, we're looking at the book of Joshua, which is just so relevant for today, and it's just such a, an incredible book about transition. And I was reminded of the words of Moses when he said this in Deuteronomy 1. The Lord said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to you, to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Um, and it's important, I think, for us, you know, there is times when we can be going around that mountain again and again and again. And it's very tempting to stay there. That was the foot of Mount Sinai. That's where God descended. And they wanted to, to remain there because that's where everything was happening. And, and yet Moses knew that God was saying, no, you've been around this mountain too long. It's time to move on. It's time to take hold of the promise um, that God had for his people. And what we love about the book of Joshua, it's such a book of taking hold. It's such a book of, you know, our responsibility. It's not just the Lord, it's our responsibility to take hold of everything that he's taken hold of us for. So we're going to pick this up again in Joshua 3. Early in the morning, Joshua, and I like that, early in the morning. You know, these guys didn't always sleep late. <laughs> it always makes me laugh because I, I used to be an owl. I used to be waking up in, at night. I could go the whole night, no sleep, and go to work. Uh, that's how I was when I was young. Now I'm a lark. <laughs> Soon after five, I'm, I'm awake. And, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's such a glorious time is first thing in the morning. But try telling that to my daughter, for example. And she's still not there yet. I'm surprised her children haven't completely destroyed her, her cycle of sleep. Um, in that way, but she is definitely not a morning person, and, and neither are her, 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 well, especially her, our middle grandson, he's just awful in the morning, he looks completely not with us, spaced out, he's in his own little world, and uh, he just does not function first thing in the morning. But here God is saying, early in the morning, these people were expectant, they were ready. They, God had given them so many instructions in Joshua 1 to get prepared for what he was going to do. And now that this was a big moment for them because they had to cross the river. And you know, Moses had led them out of slavery. He had led them across the Red Sea, but it would take a Joshua to lead them across the Jordan. And you know, what this reminded me of very much was in our Christian walk, you know, once we turn to Christ, we can come through the Red Sea, we can leave our old life behind in Egypt, we cross over the Red Sea, but we're still not taking hold of the inheritance he has for us. There's more to come. And I think many Christians, they've come through their Red Sea, if you like, 
They've, they've accepted Jesus. They've left Egypt, the world, but they haven't yet arrived at their destination. And they're wandering around the desert. And they don't realize they're wandering around the desert. They're happy to stay at that mountain. And, and the thing is, that's all very well and good. And there are seasons and times for that. But there's also a crossing over the next part too. And I think that it's very easy. I mean, even some of the tribes didn't want to cross over. There's a, a, a sense where, you know, we're out of Egypt, we're all right. And they don't even know that they're in a desert. And, and they're in that place where it's, Lord, feed me, Lord, bless me. Lord, give me manna. Lord, give me water from the rock. And it's me, me, me. And then they can take the persona that the Israelites took, the moaning and groaning. And if God didn't jump to their tune, they had a little moan at him. Oh, I don't know why God hasn't done that. You know, and we can be in that place where we can become like that. We can become a moaner and groaner and, and just expect, like little birds, beep, 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 beep. And we can stay in that place. But on our journey with God, there's another crossing over to be done. And that crossing over is taking hold of the fullness that he's taken hold of us for. That is taking hold of your destiny, your calling and your inheritance. And you can stay in the desert, you're still saved, but you're never going to walk into the fullness of what he has until you cross over your Jordan. And that's why this story is so poignant. It's so poignant for us right now, because we don't want to be wandering around in circles in the desert. There's a land to be taken, and the onus is on us to take it. That's what Joshua is all about. It is so, it, I think it's so parallel with the book of James, to be honest with you. You know, faith with your works is, is dead. You've got to do something. There's a literally a taking hold of. Uh, I often say this when it comes to like prophetic words and things, unless you take hold of it and pull it down from heaven, it remains in the spiritual realm. You have to earth and birth these things and you have to earth and birth your inheritance because no one can take hold of it for you, but you have to take hold of it for yourself. And that is what this transitional period is all about. It's being responsible. And, you know, with us on our journey with God, that responsibility increases. The more God gives to you, the more is expected of you. And that's why, you know, when we see, uh, we were talking this morning of, of Christians that um, have got a great ministry and then they fall from grace. And the repercussions are so enormous because God gave them a, a, a fantastic opportunity and responsibility. But if they don't take hold of that and allow other things to pull them off, then, you know, the much that was given to them, much is expected. Much is expected. And our, our walk with God is, is being responsible. He gives us grace, and that grace is more than enough to save us, but it's grace in order to do what he's called us to do. And not what some of the current ones are saying, grace that covers everything and do what you like and get on with. It, it doesn't work like that. 
It's grace to do what God has called us to do. So there early in the morning, all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. You see, the, they've got to wait for the right time. Everything is about timing uh, with God. You know, he's got the right time for us to move. And we, we so often get that out of place and then we wonder why. They didn't rush across the Jordan. They had to camp there, suss it out, and wait until that moment that God says right now. And I, again, here we get after three days. You know, God loves this three days. And three days is always the, the th on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. It's the day of resurrection. There's something about three days. They had to wait three days at Sinai, and now they had to wait another three days before crossing over. <clears throat> three days, it comes again and again and again through scripture. The officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people, preparing the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. You see, to, to the Israelites and all the way through the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is always synonymous with the very presence of God. Where that Ark was, God was. And that's why, you know, the times when the ark was captured and all those stories, it was a terrible thing because God had designated this wooden box covered in gold, that this was where his Shekinah presence was going to come. And so the ark, wherever that ark went, that meant the presence of God. And now the people are being told, you have to follow that ark you have to follow that presence of god and jesus came along to his disciples they were busy fishing and he said guys come and follow me the book of revelation says they will follow the land wherever he leads there's a following of jesus isn't there you know, and how often do we say as Christians, we don't want to go unless the Lord is, is there leading the way, showing us. And it's this principle here. You know, his presence has got to lead us. His presence has got to guide us. And that is what they were told to do. Wait until you see the ark and then get behind it. You are to move out of your positions and follow it you know it's no good being over here if the lord is over there if he's gone his presence has moved what are we doing over here we've got to follow the presence of god we've got to follow where he's at and i know that there's trials and tribulations on route and it's not always as straightforward as that but still we seek to live, to follow where he leads and guides us too. And the Levitical priests are carrying it, you see, and the, the Levitical priesthood, um, I, and I've, got, I've gone into this bit when I've talked about what happened at Sinai. Um, I mean, you know, it's a matter of interpretation, but I really do believe that when God said at Mount Sinai, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. He intended the whole of Israel to be a priesthood. Deuteronomy 5.5 5 says they were too nervous to go up the mountain when they were given that window of opportunity, when the loud shofar sounded, and they didn't go up the mountain. And then after, when Moses came down, after representing the people and found all the golden calf and what have you. It was only then God designated the Levites who rallied around Moses to become the priesthood. But for us, we know that 
um, the Apostle Peter says, but you are a kingdom of priests. And we know that we are the priesthood of all believers now. So when you look at the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, in a sense, that is a, a picture of, um, of, of obviously priesthood. And so we can look at some of the things and think we are the fulfillment of priesthood, priesthood as it should have been. But I do believe in, in this particular story, the Levite priest had to carry the ark. The Levite priest had to lead the way. And I think God is calling a people of prayer and worship to be the arrowhead to pave a way that the rest of the body of Christ, the rest of the arrow can follow. Somebody's got to break through something. And the picture here of the Levi priest to me is always that breakthrough. They're the ones that are paving the way for the rest of the Israelites <clears throat> to follow. But they have to move. You see, there's a moving out of your positions. If you just stay put, you're not going to get very far. You're going to end up living in, in the desert permanently. You've got to follow where the leading of that presence goes. Then you will know which way to go. Since you've never been this way before, this was a new day. And we are in new days. And it's very um, challenging. To, to, to say, okay, Lord, you've got to show us the way because Jesus, you are the way. We have not been this way before. We don't want to stay in the desert all the time. We want to get out of our positions. We want to be those that are willing to follow you wherever you might lead us because we do not know the way. We don't. And I actually believe right this moment in time, there's people who think they know the way, and we might have glimpses of that, and there's certainly those with a prophetic ministry will have glimpses of it, but I don't believe as yet we've got the full picture of what the future for the Church of Jesus Christ looks like because we're in the middle of transition. So some will have a greater clarity, but I believe that actually we, this is so key that we have to rely totally on the law because we haven't yet been this way before. I believe that something is shifting, our world is shifting, and the church has got to shift. The principles remain the same, the word always remains the same, that does not change. However, every season brings with it a new climate, if you like, a new tone, and it's finding out what is right for the, la the life that we are in right now, because the church of 500 years ago looked very different, and certainly for the generations that are following us who are a little bit older, it looks very different, and we have to be prepared for that. And we have to be prepared to get out of our comfort zone. Following <laughs> Jesus is never meant to be comfortable, but it's meant to be good. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. You know, this is, um, and of course, we, there are stories, isn't there, of, you know, when the ark was on the move, it had to be carried on the wooden poles. And if anyone touched it in the wrong way, like the story of David with Uzzah, when he touched the ark the wrong way, he died. You know, but now, through Jesus, James writes, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We don't have to keep that distance anymore because of the cross we can come right into the presence. And that's the fulfillment, that's the difference of the day we are walking in. And uh, it's such a, a, a privilege for us. 
So always with the Old Testament, you take the principles and you run it through the cross. And some things will remain the same. Some things are no longer applicable, but some things have changed. And Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So we are always responsible for consecrating ourselves, examining ourselves, our, you know, coming before God and saying, you know, Lord, there's this in my life and I repent of it, I'm sorry for it. Um, I, I want that to change. There is a responsibility in this whole thing that you have to consecrate you. Nobody can consecrate you for you. They can help you, they can guide you, but ultimately it's you that has to consecrate yourself. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things things among you and I love that you know the expectation from Joshua was that God is going to be amazing and if we don't have that expectation of a miracle wonder work in God then we're probably not going to see it there's always an expectation of how glorious he is how amazing he is how uh, what can he do and that expectation is faith that uh, God will move amongst us. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and ran ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know I'm with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. You know, God does this um, from time to time. And we see this very much with Elijah and Elisha. You know, when Elijah was taken up into heaven, and the mantle fell down on the face of the earth. And Elisha had said, I want that anointing. I want the double inheritance. I want the, the in other words, the inheritance of the firstborn. I want that. And the mantle fell down as a picture of the anointing. And Elisha picked up that coat, that mantle, and he went to the river where, um, Elijah had struck the river previously and crossed over and he picked up that mantle and he was saying what you did for Elijah you can do for me where is the God of Elijah and as he struck the river it parted and crossed over and here we have God saying to Joshua just as I parted the Red Sea for Moses, I'm going to part this Jordan for you, then they will know that I have chosen you. And it's sometimes it's very good to give testimony, to declare what God has already done, which enables him to do it again. And this is what was happening, the same miracle in a slightly different place. One was the sea, this is a river. But Joshua was going to be shown to have the anointing that was on his life, that was similar, slightly different, but similar to the anointing that was on Moses, a deliverer and a saviour. They, but again, you see, just like Moses had to pick up the stick at the Red Sea, they have to step into that river. And I often say, you know, it's a good thing because I, I don't know about you, but I'm always putting my foot in it. But sometimes you have to put your foot forward and put your foot in it and just make that move. If we're standing stationary, what can God do? But when we're a moving person, then God can move us. And I take a lot of comfort from Acts 16 when 
Paul was wanting to go east and determined to go that way, but he didn't stand still. He started to go east, but he trusted God was big enough to stop him if he was wrong. And the Holy Spirit stopped him and said, no, go west. And the man from Macedonia said, come over here and help us. So you, a moving target is easier for God to steer than somebody who's stuck in the mud and not prepared to move. And Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. And he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, all the different ites. And I, I, I read something the other day, which I just sort of share with you briefly, that, you know, it's very interesting that there were seven groups of ites. So, you know, they, and Joshua had to drive out these ites. And we know at the moment that there are ites that we need to drive out. <laughs> we need to get rid of the ites because they are the strongholds in the land. And when you're taking a land, you've got to clear it of the ites. And it's interesting how these ites manifest. And this is just uh, an example I will show you. I'm sure there's a lot more in this all, but just to give you a little picture. The Canaanites, they were people who, who did a lot of trade. They were buyers and sellers. Remember, they bought Joseph, didn't they, the Canaanites? And, you know, sometimes that whole trade, commercial, materialism thing can be a stronghold. The Hittites were more terrorists, which is interesting. They like to manipulate and dominate and put fear in people. The Hivites, they congregate in their own little communities and are kind of a law unto themselves. The Perizzites are a bit like them and, you know, but they are not ordained by God. They're a group that are outside of God's ways. The Gergeshites were they actually, they were, their name and, and who they were, were clay dwellers. And how we would relate that today is humanism. It's an interesting one, isn't it? The Amorites were warlike people and they lived in the mountains. And so, you know, often on the mountains are where the strongholds are. And we know the Amorites were a real pain to the people of God. The Jebusites, their, um, the meaning of their name is, is to tread or trample. And the Jebusites love to trample on the harvest of God. And how many times have we seen, you know, a move of God destroyed it's the Jebusites. So it's a very interesting picture, and I'm sure that's something we can really delve into, but I just wanted to open that thought up because I, I think this could be very relevant for us to see the type of oppositions that we are coming against when we are taking land. And I don't want to over-focus on that, but I think we are wanting to also be very aware of it. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. <clears throat> and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand in a heap. Now we're going to look at the... Uh, 12 and the 12 stones that these guys are going to have to pick up uh, later. But um, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. 
<coughs> now the Jordan is in flood all during harvest. You know, um, the first time I saw the River Jordan in Israel, I, I'm going to confess, I was quite disappointed. It looked like more of a stream than anything else. But we've got to remember this is many thousand years ago. And we don't know how much the, the Jordan has changed in that time. And also, um, the Jordan was in flood. And this was harvest time. So the Jordan would have been too deep to have walked across it, definitely. And it's interesting that it's harvest time. You see, Jesus said, look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. And we can look at our world now and just be overcome with the difficulties, the corruption, all those things that are going on. But there's a harvest time to be had. There's a harvest out there if we only know how to reap that harvest. So these waters were in flood, just as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. You see there, this is a moment of faith. This is where you don't know quite what's gonna happen. But you just have to believe God. You have to take that step. It can look dodgy. It can look ridiculous. And it can look, if God doesn't come through, then we've had it. And that's what that moment was. They'd got the Ark of the Covenant. They were responsible for the Ark as well. And yet they had to step in. And they stepped into the water. And the moment their foot touch that water, God, stop the water flowing. And it piled up in a heap, a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan, where the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. Now, I can't resist saying this. I have done a whole teaching on the whole thing about this, this moment and the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus was baptized by his cousin John, they believe, and it's been, you know, really confirmed in so many ways that that area where he was baptized was the same, that this all took place. And the Son of God stepped into the waters of the Jordan to fulfill all righteousness. And just like when the priest stepped in with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, all those thousands of years prior, the water went all the way back to Adam. And when the Son of God, the Lamb of God, stepped into the same water to fulfill all righteousness, that water receded and uh, um, it, as a picture of the sin receding all the way back to Adam. I often wondered, why does it call this town Adam? Why did the waters go all the way back to Adam? And then I realized, well, hang on a minute. The son of God, when he went in those waters, it, he was coming as our great, that's when his ministry started. And he took the sin of mankind all the way back to Adam. Dealt with, finished. And of course, you know, I believe that was the whole thing of Jesus' baptism was the big transferal of priesthood. When John the Baptist, the son of the Levitical priest, a, a Levi, had to baptize Jesus, son of God, who is priest of the order of Melchizedek. It was a change of priesthood taking place in the Jordan. Such a powerful, but you see, God here is paving the way. He's putting the picture in place that when Jesus came along and he said, I fulfill everything in every way. You see, the Old Testament, the more we dig, 
we see, well, hang on, Jesus fulfilled that, that was a picture, that was a picture, that was a picture. It all is a picture of him. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed up until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. You see, they waited. They waited for the brothers to come across. They had a responsibility to stand in that river. I don't know how long they stood there. It wasn't going to be a five minute wonder. There was a lot of people to cross this river. Two million or so. It must have taken ages. And God had commissioned them to stand there in the middle of the Jordan with those waters. And they knew that if they stepped out, the waters would come back. And they didn't want anyone to drown. They had to wait for the brothers to come over. Just like God waiting for all the Israelites to come out of Egypt before the Red Sea closed them. So, this is the journey. This is the first part of taking and moving into the land that God had promised his people. There was a lot more that was going to have to be done. This was not going to be easy and they didn't succeed in everything they should have succeeded in. But nevertheless, they were on their way. And the first thing they had to do was decide that they were going from one side of the Jordan to the other side. And I believe God is saying, okay, guys, are you going to go from one side into the inheritance, into the land, despite the fact there's all the ites, despite the fact there's Jericho standing right in front of you, despite all that, are you prepared to follow my presence wherever I lead you? Father, we just thank you that you always have such a perfect plan. And Lord, in this day of transition, in this day of massive change, our world is changing at such an accelerated speed. Lord, we know that we have been born into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. And so Lord, help us now to, to, to transition into the inheritance that you have for your people in this day. And we have not been this way before. So make us more and more aware that we need to really hear your voice saying this is the way we walk here, Lord. And to follow your presence, follow the Lamb wherever he may lead. And we give you praise and glory, Lord, that your will for us is not to remain in the desert, not to remain as little children, being fed and watered, and, and, but you have actually got a purpose for us that is far greater and far bigger. And I pray you will equip each and every one of us to, just as you equipped Joshua, uh, in the training you did in his life, equip us, Lord, to be able to fulfill that destiny and to lay hold of the land that you have for us. And we ask this in your very precious, precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.